All right, um, here we are on module three. We're going to uh, look at where do we find our uh, before we get started, I just want to show you on um, Moodle here. Um, these will be open and done with this. And the video I'm making right now will be uh, here under resources. And I usually post it uh, a second time also in the announcement. <clears throat> so it's in the announcement and here, the video for this uh uh, today. And then uh, the video is going to go over where do we find our, and this is the PowerPoint that I'll be looking at. And sometimes um, it works for you to go back and use the PowerPoint yourself because there are links embedded in the PowerPoint if you click on them and uh, other uh, information will come up. Um, there will, all, uh, not always, but usually there is a document. This is a Word document with a list of the names of the artists that uh, we're gonna look at today. You don't need to memorize them or anything, but um, <clears throat> at the end of the course, you will need to be able to access them. And uh, if you're really um, into taking notes as I go along, you can print this out on paper and use it to take notes if you uh, if that helps you. Um, but you guys have access to everything because these are videos that you can go back and look at anytime you need to. So um, while we go through the PowerPoint, there's some artists that have supplemental videos. There's, uh, I'm gonna ask you to watch this one about Road and Crater, the Sagrada Familia. Uh, this one, which is, I think, funny. We'll see, I don't know, maybe if you do. There's a, a website to Art Prize in Grand Rapids, and there's going to be an assignment um, about Cuba Star. And so here is an example, and I think there's also, yeah, here's a link to uh, tell you more about what Cubism is. And then we're going to have two assignments. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and open. So every week it's going to be pretty much like that. You'll have your PowerPoint, your document of written words, and then um, videos that uh, relate to the uh, topic of the PowerPoint. So let's open the PowerPoint here. Here's a little, a little different because um, it's not open, and it's the teacher's version. But... All righty, so. Um, like I said, some of these, let's see if this one, see if this works. Sideshow from the beginning. So if you look at like, like right here, see how that has a link in it? So this, uh, if you open this, well, maybe it's not going to do it on here. But if you click that, put it there will be a link uh, telling you what this building is and, and on Wikipedia. And um, But I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> it is the Tate Museum in England. The Tate Museum is a museum that's been there for a very long time, and they've uh, acquired other buildings, <clears throat> and it's expanded. Um, I, oh, I didn't want to do that. Okay, let's see if we get back here. Let's just do it this way then. There we go. Excuse me. The person that put these slides together is, I think, like cat. So here is a map of England, and I think the cat shows you where where the Tate Museum is, if you're ever in England. So this is Turban Hall. This is part of um, Tate, the Tate Museum. And it's one that we'll be seeing uh, frequently in uh, as we look at uh, different artworks. Um, it was an uh, industrial building, you know, Turban Hall, and then they uh, acquired it and turned it into a large exhibition space. And um, mm -hmm. on that link to the Tate Museum, they give more description about it, but it's uh, meant to house really uh, large pieces. Let's see if it works. There we go. So for example, this piece is 30 feet by 35 feet, and you can see it fits in there nicely. I actually saw this piece, or maybe it was, um, I think there's three of them, so I don't know if it was this one or one of the others, but <clears throat> at Meyer Gardens in Grand Rapids. And um, Meyer Gardens, um, if you've never been there, it's actually worth the trip. You want to spend some time. Um, I think it costs like maybe $10. Uh, 
but uh, it's um, a really has a really good. Uh, I would say between Meyer Gardens and the Art Institute of Chicago, both of those were listed on the top ten art museums in the world. So within a hundred miles of where most of us live, there are two of the top art museums. So even though we live in this little town, <laughs> we have access to, um, you know, some of the uh, world's best art. So this is by Louise Bourgeois. You don't, you're not going to need to memorize these, but um, she made this about her mother. Now I've read two different things. I had always read that she had a really bad relationship with her mother. Her mother was a weaver, and so that's why she chose a spider, but that she was intimidated by her mother. When I look at this sculpture, I that seems like the case to me, but then I just recently read that she made this in honor of her mother because she loved her so much. So um, I'm not sure which description is true, um, but it looks menacing to me. And when I saw it at Meyer Gardens, it was outside and it was really like as big as a building. Here's another one in Turban Hall. And this is about, this is an installation piece about weather. And so the artist, uh, Olafur Eliasson, he um, put a mirror on the ceiling and then he has like, here's the sun, but like kind of weather type uh situations so here shows people really you know looks like you're at the beach at summer sort of um, and a lot of the people laying on the floor are looking at themselves up on the ceiling this is another one that's also uh in uh that was uh installed in turban hall and this uh piece is also um, in our book. When we get to the book, there's a section on art as entertainment. And so what he did is there's these shoots that are like slides. Here you can see somebody zooming down the tube. And once again, you can see how large this building is because uh, you can see the people looking up. And there's somebody shooting down again. So here's an overview of it. And you, um, I'm scared of heights. I would probably do the shortest one or at least the second shortest one, but I bet most people would do the tall one <laughs> anyway. And when I was reading about this piece, I found out there was a woman who owned her own business and she saw um, his installation and she commissioned him to do one uh, at her where she works. And her office was on the top floor of the office building and her uh car the parking garage was in the basement of the building so when she would get ready to leave work she would slide down the tube and it would take her right to her car so i'm thinking if you work there and you wondered if the boss is gone or not you would probably see her flying by through the tube All right, so um, here's another place we find art in museums. This is um, Versailles. It's a museum in France. Uh, it was a castle and it's turned into a museum now. But uh, what's unusual about this, these slides are that here is this artist named uh, Takashi Murakami. And he would do, he does artwork that is um, more like, do you call it man manga, I guess? Um, I don't know if I got that right, but it's, you know, kind of cartoonish. And so he had this piece behind him is like what he does. Here's some work that he did in a pop-up. It was at a Louis Vuitton. I guess he designed some bags for them. But here you can see at the garden. So here are these formal gardens. And then here, uh, you know, from France, from another century. And then here's his contemporary artwork from Japan. And, uh, you know, they, are, they couldn't be more different. So when we talked about content and context, um, one of the things about this one is context. It uh, really, you think, that, you know, does it belong here? And um, putting them next to each other is actually part of the show, the contrast. Um, and 
I watched a video about this and mostly people were fine, but there was a couple of people who got upset again <laughs> and they were mad because they said this stuff belongs, we came here to see the history of the museum and this stuff belongs at the contemporary museum and, you know, don't make us look at it or something. So here's the, um, I guess there's always people with strong opinions about everything. Um, here are, mar you know, traditional marble sculptures. And then here is, uh, the um, more colorful one, <laughs> the murals on the ceiling with another. And this almost does fit in. They're all so ornate, but you can see a big difference between the uh, chandeliers and the uh, sculpture here. And there is, I think on one of these, uh, there is a link. I, I think there was a video, but I think it, it's not there anymore, but um, you can see a video of what what this looks like in person, but I think you can get a pretty good idea. Here's the people that assembled it. <clears throat> so another place that we find art is churches, a lot of religious art. And um, you probably have heard of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, there's, uh, you know, we'll talk about it more when we talk about frescoes. It is a, a plaster fresco. And, um, you know, the part, one of the things that always amazes me about this <clears throat> is that uh, uh, Michelangelo, the artist, didn't even want to do this. The Pope said he had this, this was a plain uh, chapel and he wanted it painted. And um, Michelangelo really loved carving carving marble, and so the Pope said, "I will get I will give you this marble from um, the island, Greek island Paros, where apparently it was some of the finest marble." And uh, he goes, "You know, I'll get the marble for you to do your sculptures if you do this." And so, um, you know, to to do one of like considered the world's masterpieces and to do it begrudgingly is kind of amazing to me. But, um, anyway, here's a. We've seen this one, I think, before, but it's a close-up of um, what one of the just one of the panels look like. Here's another church. This is in Barcelona, Spain, and this is called uh, Sagrada La, the Sagrada Familia. And um, I think if you look at the people standing right here, right in the very front, you can really get an idea of how large this is. Um, if you're interested. Look, just go online and put it in and uh, and put in drone. And there is, um, I've seen some drone footage uh, where they fly over it. And it is amazing. You know, Barcelona is a large city, but when you look at it from above, this thing just towers everything. And what it was started in uh, 139 years ago. Uh, they started it in... Uh, March of 1882, and it's not going to be completed until 2026. I believe they just put some spires up on the top. Uh, we do have a video. Watch the video. Um, it's it's really amazing. Um, that somebody started, and then this artist, uh, uh, it's actually known uh, Antonio Gaudi, who does beautiful mosaics. He took it over, and he worked on it for his whole life until he died. And they're they're still continuing it. So you can see here's looking up. It's almost like like psychedelic. Looking up at the lights. The video, definitely uh, watch the video because you'll get a feeling uh for for more of it. Um okay, here's another place we find um artwork and that's art prize um i have a link to the website on there some maybe some of you have been there um it's been going on for i think at least like maybe 10 years um they the city of grand rapids turns the whole city into like a big art event and um they have prizes uh and people come from all over the world to display art there and try to win uh there's very generous prizes um and they, it keeps evolving. That uh, they started out having a popular vote, and the popular vote um, was that people with their phones or computers would vote on what they wanted. But then um, <clears throat> there are people who complained 
we're complaining, right? And they wanted to have uh, like um, professional people uh, jury the work. So people who work in the art field. So what the uh, art prize committee did was they have two prizes now. They have one that is the popular vote. And then they uh, every year bring in different art experts. So art experts would be like people who work at art museums, who publish magazines, you know, writers, um, you know, professors, different people who's, you know, pretty much that's their whole occupation is uh, studying art. <clears throat> So then what's also nice about it, um, I guess I like it as an educator, that uh, they, when these people come, they always have a panel and have the people explain why they pick the pieces that they pick. And there's awards for uh, both, both, uh, both parts. So if you look, here is one year, and this is a map of Grand Rapids. And the thing is, you might think each one of those is like maybe one gallery or one artwork, but some of them are uh, like a museum that have many pieces in it or the convention center. And every year it's a little different. <clears throat> Sometimes there's people who take abandoned buildings and you know rework them. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, you see something here, it looks like it's on the bridge, but there's even been uh, artworks that um, like float on the river, uh, places, unlikely places, um, uh, like restaurants or something will open up or churches, um, <clears throat> libraries. And so and so each one of those black dots is a venue for different artwork. So it takes, you, even in a whole day, you can't see the whole thing. Um, but you can go through and then you can vote on the ones that, um, yeah. oops, excuse me, well, we'll go to this one. So I did see this one. And what's interesting about, first of all, it's beautiful, I think, and it lights up the whole room. So it's like, uh, creates a whole environment. And when I went, um, you know, when sometimes when, like, have you ever been on vacation and went into a church and so things are all noisy and then when everybody gets into the church, it just quiets right down. This kind of had that spiritual feel to it. People were sort of almost like, in reverence when they were in the room. And what, what's unusual about this one is that this particular year, this was the piece that the art professionals chose for the top prize. And it was also the public chose it. So this woman got, uh, this woman, her name is, I don't know if I can say it, uh, Anelia Kwayam Aga. She got both prizes. And this was uh, hosted by the Grand Rapids Art Museum. And, uh, a year or two later, they gave her a whole show of her own. Here's another one where you can see how it um, takes over the whole room and even the people become part of it. Here's another one that has kind of an unusual story. These people <clears throat> were from Michigan and the middle of Michigan. It's a husband and wife. And um, for starters, if I asked you what this was, looks like, most people think a painting, but if you look up closer, it was actually all stitched fabric. And they won the top prize. Um, and then uh, what happened next year is that they won the top prize again by the popular vote. So um, like I said, the show keeps evolving. So then uh, they said, okay, so we don't want the same person, we don't want the same people winning every year. So um, then they said that uh, if you entered again, after you've already won a top prize, you're not eligible for a top prize. And then <clears throat> it also changed a little bit during COVID because I, they did, they didn't really do the big festival. They did something else that was way more, uh, less social, like for people not to be mingling, I guess, but um, I believe it's back to normal now. Okay, uh, so yeah, so if you get a chance, it's usually in the fall, it's free. Um, go on the weekends if you have to, but I would suggest going during the week because I've gone on a weekend and oh my gosh, it's just like, you can hardly get around, there's so many people. Um, and it's also, I don't know now since COVID, but before COVID, you know, it just kept growing and growing, like, you know, music, there was going to be music, and then they start showing films, and, um, you know, always lots of food, <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, got, like, almost like a festival atmosphere, and, um, uh, yeah, it's fun. <clears throat>
I seem to have a frog in my throat. <laughs> uh, maybe if you've been to Chicago, you're familiar with this. Uh, the the artist named it Cloud Gate because it's like a you know looks like an entryway into the into the atmosphere. But um, the people of Chicago call it the Bean because obviously it looks like a big bean. When uh, this is considered public art, and you'll see public art. Uh, right in, you know, Dwajak, actually, for a small town, I think it might, might have read this a while ago. I don't know if it's still true, but I think it had the most public art for a town of its size in the country, I think. But even if that's not an accurate, even if that's not accurate, Dwajak does have quite a bit of public art for a small town. Um, also, St. Joe, if you go to St. Joe, the... Um, Krasil Art Center has put sculptures all along the walkway down to the beach. And uh, they also have a large Richard Hudd sculpture that is uh, right out at the end of the pier or by the pier. So you can see public art. Um, and the bean is, I think, I'm going to say kind of beloved. You can go and uh, see yourself. You can see the whole city of the skyline and you can see the sky. So it's... Uh, so the bean shape pays off. It's all encompassing. Here is another kind of public art, I guess. <laughs> this is the Lascaux Caves in France. Um, they are uh, like from prehistoric times, but they were discovered, I think, in like the 1940s. Yeah. And um, there was some kids playing and uh, young guys, young boys playing and uh, their dog went in to a hole and didn't come out. And so they went in and chased it. And when I read it, I just happened to remember that the dog's name was Robot, which I don't know. I kind of like that for no reason at all. Uh, so the guys went in, the, the kids went in to find Robot and what they found was the Lascaux Caves. So these became very famous. They're uh, all these prehistoric paintings uh, that they now had access to that had not been seen before. What happened is it became a tourist place. They're quite extensive. I have um, a video I'll show you later. <clears throat> you can see more of them. But um, they, uh, as all the people came through to look at them, they started to deteriorate from the bacteria. So uh, what, the, what they did was they sealed the original up and only let people in for research or, you know, um, when they needed to, you know, to look at something. And then they recreated a whole nother Lascaux cave near there that uh, duplicates it, that uh, is one that people can go through so they can still get the experience of it without destroying the original one. So you can see they're actually quite beautiful. You know, and when you think about it, uh, what did they have to work with? You know, if you take like a red rock and drag it across concrete, you'll get a red mark, right? Um, so they had the natural pigments, natural earth minerals, and then as their binder, they would have um, either probably wax, you know, like candle wax or uh, animal fat. Um, back to the Lascaux Cave, they're not really sure why they were painting those, uh, you know, so long ago, there's a lot of theories, you know, one of them is that they were praying to the gods for uh, a good hunt. There's also the theory that they went into the caves to stay warm and they were just bored. So, you know, when you're in a meeting and you um, start, to, you know, that's, you start doodling, you know, it might even be, you know, it was something sort of like that. But it is, you know, at least part of humans' uh, urge to, to create or that wanting to um, make marks. So there's uh, this is uh, James Terrell, and he did a different kind of caves. And uh, these are uh, chambers that he built that deal with optical illusions and astronomy. And there um, is a whole video where he explains it and takes you through them. So I'm going to have you watch the video. Here's an overview. This is one that's a whole chamber that's like a telescope. <clears throat> and when you first start out, this blue circle is round. But he said um, it kind of plays with people's perception. So it's all ch it's all changes by the way that you view it. He got a grant to start. Uh, he got a, a crater. 
uh, out in the desert and um, he got a grant and bought this and started building them. And he's, it's been his whole life's work. He's has several craters or several um, chambers in the crater. And uh, what he does to raise money is once he gets to a certain point, he opens it up to the public. Uh, you know, people pay to come in and see what he's done so far. And then that funds him to do the next uh, sections of it. So uh, take a look at the video, and uh, when you walk through it with, uh, with the video and him explaining it, it might make more sense. This is Banksy, and uh, Banksy is uh, still current. He is supposedly anonymous. Um, I guess he is. And he shows up all over the world and will do these kind of social commentary murals. He popped up in Ukraine and did um, some there um, just recently. And uh, he, different cities react differently. So he might just show up all of a sudden in Toronto and on the side of a building will be this mural painted in the middle of the night. So some cities love them and treat them like art and preserve them. And some cities think of it like graffiti and get rid of them. <clears throat> here's uh, here's another one. Here's one of the Olympics, uh, somebody stealing one of the Olympic rings. And I think this might be alluding to what I just mentioned. So here is the Lascaux Caves, you know, these uh, valuable uh, um, part of history and here they have somebody, you know, power washing it. So that might be about, you know, people power washing his work. He also does installations and this, he gathered with a bunch of artists and uh, made the anti Disneyland and it's called dismal land. And there's a video of it. I, to my sense of humor, it's very funny. Um, some people who love Disney world are upset, <laughs> but, uh, Take a look at the video, it's not that long. And here's the uh, the castle. I think there was a movie by Alfred Hitchcock called The Birds, where all these birds were attacking people. That's the only thing I can think of there. Here's the princess in her, you know, in the pumpkin. But I think it's kind of more like a princess die thing with all the paparazzi while she's in trouble. Oops. So yeah, watch that video. And uh, yeah, about Banksy. And then uh, that's the last artist we're going to look at. But these are some other places where you can find art online. And boy, um, online art has always has been around, but during COVID, it really took off because people weren't going into, you know, galleries and gallery openings. So this Gagosian was one of the first and they had this is called like brick and mortar meeting a real gallery but then they also had a really strong internet presence uh art fairs um if you like art fairs there's one coming up in saint joe soon the saint joe art fair and then also this is a uh, different uh, kind of like an art fair but um like in chicago go out to Navy Pier or the Merchandise Mart, uh, like once a year, each one of them, I think, have a big art event. And <clears throat> here's, uh, I don't think this is Navy Pier, but it's, um, it could be because they all look like this, where they set up these uh, galleries. And then so here, like right in the front, you can see this is from Toronto. So here's a gallery, you know, they brought their work from Canada, you know, and you'll see like from Israel, Spain, Italy, people from all over, New York, Santa Fe, all these different galleries from around the world come and then people can go like downtown Chicago and I uh, usually pay like an entry fee, maybe like 15 bucks or something. And then uh, you can go in and purchase artwork if you have the funds. And if you don't have the funds, you can go in and look at artwork. <laughs> Both are good. Here's an art opening, uh, different galleries have, this one uh, looks unusually packed, <laughs> but uh, uh, usually there's food, they're kind of party-like. Sometimes when they're this crowded, you can't, you have to come back to see the artwork, but it's fun, it's part of the whole thing. <clears throat> and this uh, is a cooperative. So artist cooperatives, um, some of the really top galleries will take even up to 60% of a commission on artwork. So if you 
you know, put a painting in for a thousand dollars, they would get 600 of it. And sometimes, and pretty half is about average 500. Uh, local, some more smaller local galleries will um, only take about 35 or 40 percent. Um, so <clears throat> there's artists who don't want to have that much of their uh, profit uh, taken by the gallery. So they will, groups of artists will get together and open a cooperative. They actually, some of them last. There's one in uh, St. Joe Chartreuse that's been around for a while, but, um, uh, you know, because it takes a whole group of people all being accountable. They all have to divide up all the tasks, which actually are, is quite a bit because there's, you know, manning the gallery, paying the bills, um, you know, having liability insurance uh, for people that come in there and for the artwork, you have to, um, you know, be able to ring sales up accurately so everybody gets paid correctly. Um, you know, so you have to pay taxes on it. And, you know, the gallery has to stay clean, maintained. The shows have to be put up, taken down. There has to be somebody working there. So the artists have to divide up all of these uh, chores, tasks, duties, and, you know, spend time in the gallery to keep it open. So to get a group of people to all work together and do that, so especially sometimes artists can be kind of independent, you know, um, they, they all have to agree on the same ideas. That That's like tough. But if they can do it and they have the time, you know, for some people, they just want to work on their artwork and let somebody else do all that. You know, you have to do marketing. You have to, you know, get postcards made. You have to contact people, um, you know, and galleries that uh, are professional have um, some skills at some of those things and connections that sometimes just make it worth it because that's all they're doing full time while the artist is doing artwork. So it's a toss up, but it's another option. Also, uh, as I said, toss up, there's also pop up. Pop up is a gallery that's not really a gallery, but uh, somebody has a vacant space, part of a restaurant or whatever, and they let you do an installation for a while, which is just kind of fun. And the person put these slides together, put in something funny from Jack Handy, so you can read that. All right, so let's see. I need to get back to our assignment. Um, I don't want to get out of here, so let's see that's how this works. Oh, well, there's the tape monitor that, I, that popped up when, uh, yeah, I popped it twice, it looks like, okay. And here we go, back to our course. Alrighty, so <clears throat> go through the videos that I just talked about, and we're going to have two assignments. One of them is this is message to the feature. Here's the video right here that is about those cup caves. So um, let me just read this as we. Well, those Gallup cave caves were created by unknown artists over 17,000 years ago. Take a look at the images left behind. And then you're going to answer these questions, 200 words. What do you think the artists were trying to share here? So you take a guess. Why do you think they did it? How Now imagine that you have a cave that won't be discovered for 20,000 years. What images would you want to communicate to future generations? What objects and events from our era would be worth sharing? What should we warn them about? Describe and explain your proposed depictions. If it helps to include a drawing, please attach it. You don't have to, but if you want, if you're so inclined, you can do that. And it should be 200 words. So, uh, we have lunch. and then let's see. I come down here. No, it doesn't look anymore. Okay. So now I want to go back to um, the other side. So let's say we talk about cutism. Maybe the week before, but anyway. Uh, stupid. Here we go. So here, back in read, well, I won't go back up there, but up in resources, there is um example of a cubist painting and also a link to an artist website that uh, describes what cubism is if you need to refresh um, your memory or to get some inspiration. So what you're going to do 
and this is a discussion uh, so we can share them with the class. If we were in a face-to-face -face class, we would put them all up and take a look at them, but our way of doing that in this class will be to post them onto the discussion. So what you're going to do is pick one object or person and take five photos, each from a different angle. For example, if you chose a person as your subject, you might take a photo of the top of their head, the back of their head, looking up at their chin, et cetera. You know, if it was your car, you might just take all different angles of your car. It could be any object in your house. If it's your pet, you, you know, might have your dog's face, ears, tail, you know what, uh, just all different angles. So um, then look up Cubis collages online if you need more examples of different styles. So you're going to print each photo on office paper. Um, <clears throat> if you're into it, you can do color, but that's more expensive. So you're free to do just black and white, it's fine. And you should have five pages when you're done. So you should have five different angles, each printed on one uh, page. Then you're gonna take those photos and cut them up with scissors into many shapes and pieces and assemble the pieces into a new design. You may add other pieces of paper if you wish um, using, uh, like, for example, sometimes, oh, I think we've seen, the, you'll see some examples of musical instruments. So, you know, if you had a picture of a guitar and you cut it all up, uh, you might take a picture of some sheet music or some sheet music you don't want. <laughs> and you might cut that up too and, and include it in like as part of it. But you just, you don't have to. It's just, I have people in the class that love to do art projects. And for you, you can go crazy with this. And there's people in the class who, do not want to do our projects and we'll just do it to get it over with so they can get a grade. Uh, it's all fine uh, as long as you as long as you uh, uh, do it. And as long as you try it, you'll get credit. This is not an uh, art studio class. Um, the point is sometimes it's easier to understand things when you actually try them yourself. So uh, trying to do a cubist collage um, for most people is fun and it also gives you a better understanding of what cubism is. So you're gonna take the cut, cut the photos up with scissors into many shapes and pieces and assemble them into a new design. You can add other pieces of paper if you wish, using a blank sheet of office paper and a glue stick if you have one, otherwise use whatever glue you have at home. Um, glue the new design to the paper. When complete, scan or take a photo and post it under the discussion titled Cubist Collage, so right here. Please post a photo of your finished collage plus a comment on a classmate's collage. Do you think there's a good example of cubism in the entries? Which one and why? And do you have any constructive suggestions about a collage? Like if you saw somebody who maybe you liked it, but you don't, you know, you think it could show cubism better, you could explain that too. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we have that. And then uh, just because we're a 10 week course and we're gonna need to uh, move a little faster than normal on Thursday, I'm going to present uh, a small part of our next, um, we'll have a, a one video and uh, one fairly easy assignment um, on Thursday. So uh, I will post that on Thursday. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, let me know. And I hope you have fun with these. And I look forward to seeing your creations.